Testosterone is an amazingly powerful hormone with multiple functions. And now more than ever, you've probably heard people talking about low T or low testosterone and just testosterone clinics popping up everywhere. But let me give you this interesting piece of information. There are studies that estimate that up to 25% of males that have been receiving testosterone therapy never even got an initial testosterone test to see what their levels were at. So how would you even know if you had low testosterone in that situation? Well, in today's video, we're gonna actually talk about what constitutes low testosterone, what happens to the body with low levels, so the signs and symptoms that people might experience with low testosterone, and of course, for the main goals and the whole point of why we might initiate or start someone on testosterone. It's gonna be a hormonal one, so let's do this. So let's start with where testosterone is produced. Testosterone is produced in these amazing structures called the testes. And you are looking at a very close up view of one testis, the right one to be exact. And you can notice these string like structures and these are called seminiferous tubules. Now the seminiferous tubules actually produce sperm. They don't produce the testosterone. But in between these tubules are clusters of cells called the interstitial cells of Leydig or sometimes just called Leydig cells. Now these Leydig cells actually make up about 20% of the overall mass of the testes and these are the cells that produce testosterone. Now we should note that other androgens, which are hormones that have masculinizing effects and testosterone being the main androgen, are produced in other areas of the body, such as the outer portion of the adrenal gland called the adrenal cortex. And this is actually where females can get some androgens. However, this is a very small amount when we compare it to the amount produced by the testes. For example, in males, the androgens secreted or produced by the adrenal cortex accounts for less than 5% of the masculinizing effects. And in females, it pretty much causes no major masculine characteristics except for contributing to the development of pubic hair and axillary hair, which is a fancy pants way of saying armpit hair. So what constitutes low testosterone? Well, a pretty good place to start would be what are the normal ranges? So if we were to do like a total testosterone test on a male, we would see that the normal range is pretty broad. It would actually be anywhere from 300 nanograms per deciliter up to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. Now there might be some subtle variations depending on which lab does the test as far as those numbers, but for the most part, 300 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. With females, as an FYI, it's much lower. It'd be 15 to about 70 nanograms per deciliter. So you might think anything below 300 in a male would can be considered low testosterone. And that actually is the number or the cutoff that the AUA uses, which is the American Neurological Association for saying low testosterone, anything below 300, at least from the testing standpoint. And the reason I stress that is because this is really important. There is more to low testosterone than just the numbers. Having a number of 300 nanograms per deciliter all by itself is not enough to diagnose someone with low testosterone. There are more criteria that need to be met. First, you actually have to have two test results that show low testosterone, and these tests need to be done on separate days, and ideally they're done in the morning. Now the reason why it's more ideal to take the testosterone levels or do the testing in the morning is because testosterone levels have what's known as a diurnal variation. Or in other words, the levels fluctuate throughout the day, with the highest levels being at about 8 a.m. Now we do need to mention or at least specify that this variation in testosterone levels throughout the day is much more prominent in younger males because as males age, that variation of the testosterone levels throughout the day becomes less and less. And you can really see this from this little whiteboard chart with the blue line showing how it varies with younger males and that peak at 8 a.m., whereas the red line shows how it varies less and less with the older males. So admittedly, taking the levels in the morning does become less important as males age. However, many of the medical associations still tend to recommend doing the testing in the morning to help maintain consistency of timing and to help minimize any possible variation that could take place. But now that we've gone over the ranges and the variation, what else do we need to officially diagnose someone with low testosterone? And this next part is very important to this diagnosis. Yes, we need the two tests showing low testosterone levels, plus the person needs to be experiencing 
signs and symptoms that are associated with low testosterone. And these signs and symptoms can be quite the list. And this list includes physical signs and symptoms, reduced lean muscle mass, obesity, reduced energy and fatigue, reduced endurance, diminished work performance, diminished physical performance, loss of body hair, reduced beard growth, cognitive signs and symptoms, depression, cognitive dysfunction, reduced motivation, poor concentration, poor memory, irritability, sexual signs and symptoms, decreased libido, and reduced erectile function. So as you can see, having even just a few of these signs and symptoms wouldn't be much fun at all. And it's also important for us to point out that if we go back to this list, that these signs and symptoms are not just exclusive to low testosterone. You could look at this list and say, man, I've experienced a handful of these signs and symptoms throughout my life. And so in other words, there are other potential causes to these signs and symptoms and why it's also important for us to not just be all willy nilly with giving people testosterone and just blaming all of our signs and symptoms on low T, if you will. But yes, it is justifiable if somebody meets the diagnostic criteria of those two low testosterone tests, plus the signs and symptoms to initiate testosterone replacement therapy. But even then, it's still important to have clear expectations. And I do this with my patients. One actually came in the other day where we did a lot of these tests and the expectations are, hey, if you're gonna take testosterone replacement therapy and you meet these diagnostic criteria, you still have to understand that it's not necessarily going to fix all of these issues. And so that's where I think we need to go to the next step here and talk about the goals of testosterone replacement therapy and that'll help us to understand who should stay on the testosterone versus who maybe should come off of it even if they initially started the testosterone because of meeting this diagnostic criteria. According to the AUA, the American Neurological Association, the target range for testosterone therapy is to use the lowest dose possible while getting somebody up to about 450 to 600 nanograms per deciliter. And that range can be a little bit hotly debated in some circles, and we can get into that a little bit later, but the AUA for the most part knows their stuff, and so it's a pretty good range to start with. Now remember, this is not just to raise the levels just for the sake of raising the levels. It's raising the testosterone in combination with an improvement in the signs and the symptoms. Because there are situations where if somebody got their levels up to 450 to that 600 range and they had no improvement in their signs and symptoms, the data shows that it's a pretty good chance that testosterone is not really the problem or the cause of their symptoms. And in that case, the AUA actually recommends that that person should discontinue taking the testosterone, again, not to just take it for the sake of having higher numbers. And I do wanna go back to that part where I mentioned there can be a debate around that target range for testosterone, specifically around that upper limit of 600. Is there ever a reason to go higher than that 600 upper limit recommended by the AUA? Let's say we had somebody who got some improvement getting to around 600, but then their levels got up to like 700 or maybe even a little above, and they continued to have improvement. So those are those situations where you think, okay, maybe in a case by case basis, it might make sense to go higher than that initial recommended range of 450 to 600. Although most people, if they haven't experienced, again, any improvement in that range, probably not gonna be the testosterone that's causing their symptoms. But this is why it's also, again, so important to be working with a clinician so that you can monitor the response to therapy, which kind of takes me to a little bit of a soapbox, and that is the importance of follow-up. There is data that suggests that after being initiated on testosterone therapy, nearly half the men do not follow up to get their levels drawn again. Now, we're not gonna be judgy here because yes, we understand life can get in the way, things come up, etc. but you can't expect to be very effective with testosterone replacement therapy or any hormone replacement therapy for that matter if we're not monitoring the levels to see how our bodies are responding. Do you need a dose adjustment? Do we need to raise it? Do we need to lower it? Are the symptoms improving? This follow-up will truly help guide the continuation of the treatment. So hopefully that gives you a good baseline understanding about testosterone levels and the approach to initiating therapy. But I do have one more question for you, a problem you could help me solve. What if you had a very large tank and to the left of it, there's a 10 kilogram toy car in a separate tank that is 1 20th of the radius of the larger tank. How much mass can the 10 kilogram toy car hold in the larger tank while the water levels are even? Is it 10 kilograms, 40 kilograms, 400? Well, you can find the answer to this by visiting the sponsor of today's video, 
Brilliant. Brilliant.org is an amazing interactive online learning platform for STEM subjects. It's one of the best ways to learn math, science, and computer science. I personally use Brilliant still to this day. I find it fun and interactive, yet challenging enough to keep my attention. And some of my favorite courses are the ones on scientific thinking, which is actually where you can find the answer to that toy car question that we just posed. Brilliant is also constantly adding new lessons each and every month, so you will definitely find something for you regardless of where you are on your educational journey. So if you're interested, go to brilliant.org IHA to get a free 30-day trial, plus the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. And when you do find the answer to that car question, go ahead and post it in the comments below, as well as let us know what you thought of the video. I also wanna let everybody know if you want more information on testosterone, we did a video earlier where we talk about all of its amazing effects on the human body, and we'll link it here as well. And if you feel the need, like and subscribe, and of course, we'll see you in the next video.